today we were going to study a little bit more about the Assyrian and about the Babylonian Empire. And the thing is, actually, where we stopped yesterday, around thousands before Christ, Egyptian history has not ended. But it is not that important anymore. And the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires, they become the predominant empires in the next 400 years. So from about 1,000 to around 500, 600 before Christ. So, and actually, um, it's called the New Assyrian Empire and the New Babylonian Empire because history of Assyrian, Babylonian and Assyrian history begins way before that. There is the Old Babylonian Empire, there's the Middle Babylonian Empire, and there's a New Babylonian Empire. This is the Babylon we uh, most often speak about, and the same accounts for the Assyrian Empire, but they're, until that point, not that important. History becomes important at around 950 before Christ when Ashur, which is the Assyrian Empire, when this re-emerges. So after a down period, it gets strong again and becomes this new, new Assyrian Empire. And it quickly enters the expansion phase. This begins around 90 years later under Shalmaneser III. And we know Shalmaneser III from the history of North Israel because at that time, King Yehu from North Israel and so-called Chaldeans, um, which are the later Babylonians, they become tributary vessels of Shalmaneser III. And, and, and Shalmaneser III eventually forms this new Assyrian Empire. And why is this new Assyrian Empire so powerful? Because they were the first to use iron weapons until that there are other weapons used, for example, copper weapons, but, eisen, uh, but iron is more durable. Um, and therefore, the um, Assyrian army was um, the most, most pow known as the most powerful, yet most ruthless and cruel, most cruel army that was ever seen to that point. Okay, and then um, this whole empire looked like this, so it kind of covered like whole, when you see the map, um, it covered like whole of... Um, Mesopotamia, also um, today Syria, and uh, they also wanted to go into Levante, where North and Israel and Judah were located. And under, uh, so about one, 100 years later, under the reign of Tiglat Pileser III, I think many of you know this king, um, Assyria finally became this uh, super, had the superpower role. Um, because uh, Tiglath Pileser was the one who made the most um, territorial advances. So as you can see here, uh, see here in the map, when you compare that to here before, also the um, kingdom of Uratu was uh, conquered. They went more into Turkey. Um, they had some influence, sphere of influence in the Phoenician uh, and Middle uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea. And they even now want, uh, went into North Israel and Judah. And this work was also continued by his successors, Shalmaneser V and Sargim II. We know this, these kings because they play an important role in the Bible history too. So when Shalmaneser, when Tiglat Pileser III died, and at that time, Pekach from Israel was the king and of North Israel, and Pekach was uh, the tributary vessel to Assyria, so to Tiglat Pileser III. So when, uh, when Tiglath Pileser III died and Shalmaneser V became king, um, Pekach of Israel thought that this would be a good time to fall away from Assyria. Um, so then he said to Shalmaneser V, I don't want to pay tribute anymore. And he therefore allies with Ratzin of Aram, so with uh, the Aramean city-states, um, to make this anti-Assyrian coalition and they also try to force Judah to join into their anti-Assyrian alliance. Um, but at that time, ah King Ahaz of Judah, which is the father of King Hezekiah, he reigns over uh, Judah, and he doesn't want to ally because he clearly knows North Israel and the Aramean city-states are too weak. So what he does in turn is at just asking Assyria for help against this alliance. So, 
Okay, so and for Shalmaneser the fifth, this is obviously a two-way win because in this, uh, with this new alliance with Judah, he can destroy the Aramean North Israel threat because um, Judah and Assyria encircle these um, North Israel and uh, the Aramean city-states. And he can even extend his sphere of influence to Palestine because um, Judah also becomes a tributary vessel of Assyria. And eventually, Israel, North Israel ceases to exist because it is conquered 722 BC um, by Shalmaneser V. Now, and this, um, and this, this further continues. The rise of the new Assyrian Empire goes on, and at 700, 705 to 681, there's the reign of Sennacherib II. Sennacherib II, he made Nineveh um, the Assyrian capital city. I think many of you know Nineveh from the, um, from the history of Prophet Joel. Um, and at that time, Nineveh was the most progressive and the most modern and um, most beautiful city that was ever seen. From the scriptures and record archaeological findings, we know that the king's palace was about 125,000 square meters large. So this was a really vast temple that showed the mighty and the power of the Assyrian king over Middle East and its influence over the whole world. Um, in the archaeological findings, this palace was called a palace without a rival. So there was no other power, no other person as the Assyrian king that could build such a beautiful um, palace. And with about 150,000 inhabitants, Nineveh at that time was the largest metropolis of the world, kind of like maybe New York or like Tokyo or like, uh, like, like Seoul with its 20 million in the agglomeration. And this most powerful king, Sennacherib II, um, he went 700, he, he wanted to conquer even more because he wanted to make Assyria even more powerful. And therefore, he wa finally wanted to crush Judah because Judah at that time, North Israel was already taken, but Judah was still kind of independent, just a tributary vessel. And he said, I want to finally defeat that small kingdom still resisting Assyria. And when, when an Assyrian king said that to, against a kingdom, this was really a reason to fear the Assyrians. Because what were the tactics of the, Assyrian, of, the, of the Assyrian king and of the Assyrian army? Why could they build such a powerful empire? So from the archaeological findings, we find this. I felt 3,000 of their fighting men with the sword. I carried off prisoners, possessions, oxen, and cattle from them. I burned many captives for, from them. I captured many troops alive. From some I cut off their arms and hands. From others I cut off their noses, ears, and extremities. I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one of the heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. I burned their adolescent boys and girls. I raised, destroyed, burned, and consumed the city. So, so these were the tactics of the uh, Assyrian army. So, um, I have many people in Judah, they were probably in great fear that, uh, Assyri that, that the Assyrian king would do this to the Judeans also. So Egypt and the other state at that time, they made, uh, therefore made an anti-Assyrian alliance. And therefore, at that time, Judah was alone against Judah was alone against um, Assyria because they weren't part of this anti-Assyrian alliance. So King Hezekiah was alone, and Jerusalem was the last defense line because all the other cities were captured. But but I, but but prophet but the but God says to, but God said to prophet Isaiah that he should tell King Ezekiah, which was a God fearing king, that he should tell him this. Tell you, Master, this is what the Lord says: Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words 
with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have, have blasphemed me. With these words, God wanted to assure to Ezekiel that God was on the side of Judah and that God would help them, even though the general of Sennacherib said, On what are you basing this confidence of yours? On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save this land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? So with this, the Assyrian general and the Assyrian king said they, that they are even more powerful than God himself. But through this, do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of King Ashuri has blasphemed me, God now shows who has the true rulership and who is the true king, because God now will help Judah and Ezekiel. So Ezekiel hears these words from Isaiah around 701 BC, when Jerusalem is besieged. And in the in trust of the Lord, he starts building city defenses. For example, we know of the Ezekiel Siloam tun uh, Tunnel, which was built at that time for water supply, for the protection and um, for getting water to Jerusalem. And at that night, we experience the hand of God, which protected Judah and which defeated the Assyrian king. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are killed. And the remaining Assyrian soldiers, they all have to flee and go back, including Sennacherib and his general. And this was a great victory, a great victory by God for Judah, because the Assyrians, they could never conquer Judah. The conquering of Judah happened in the Babylonian time, but the Assyrians were never, were never able to conquer Judah. At that same time, there was also Ezekiel's illness. Um, Ezekiel's illness is um, in a later chapter than this incident, um, the siege of Jerusalem. Um, but actually, when we calculate the times, it was a little bit earlier. It was 10 years prior to the siege. So we will read of Ezekiel's illness. And Ezekiel was about to die. But what did Ezekiel pray? He prayed, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion. Second Kings chapter 20. And God heard this prayer. And God, God heard this prayer and therefore gave him 15 more years to live. So he, he died in 696. So why was it then important that Ezekiel lived 15 more years? Why was it important that he did not die in 711 BC? Because without Ezekiel's, first, two, two things. First, without Ezekiel's prayer and Ezekiel's trust in God, 10 years later, when Sennacherib tried to invade and conquer Judah, Judah would have been conquered by the Assyrians. And secondly, when Ezekiel would have died 711, his son Manasseh, which would succeed him, would not have been born. And what should then, what should, how should it then go uh, further with the line of David until Jesus? So even in the face of persecution, even in the face of death, Ezekiel lived absolutely faithful to God's words, and he testif always testified to his trust and faithfulness in the Almighty God. And Therefore, through him, God could save a whole nation first, and secondly, he could continue his salvation history because through his son, the line of David could be continued and secured. And this is what Jesus, what God himself um, also, what God himself also ensures and says to him, I will add 15 years to your life. And why? And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king Assyria. I will defend this city. God protects Jerusalem. 
for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. So God will protect the city. God will give him 15 more years so that God's promise to David and to the forefathers can be continued and the salvation plan of Jesus can also be continued. And this is the story behind Hezekiah. Now, how does Assyrian rule continue? The Assyrians, they could never conquer Judah. But therefore, they just skipped Judah because Judah was protected by the hand of God. That's what the, that's what, that's what the, um, that's what the Assyrians had to, had, had to see. Therefore, they went on to conquer Egypt. So they omitted Judah, and at the battles of Gaza and of El Teke, they defeated the Egyptians, and under the next king, of, um, so who succeeded Sennacherib II, the next king, Ezra Haddon, he invaded Egypt, he conquered Memphis. Um, it was for only about 15 years, but at that time, we see how, this, uh, how big the Assyrian kingdom was. So um, when you see at this map, um, whole of Middle East, even Egypt, was under the sphere of influence of the Assyrian king. And also the Medes, the Elamites, Babylon, Babylon and the Anatolian um, people, they, 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 these, these kingdoms, they all become the vessels of Assyria. So Assyria was really powerful at that time. But how did it all fall? The big world empire that the Assyrians have built up until King Ezra Haddon um, in these years, it all quickly fall, uh, bro broke down in just about 50 years. Assyria's decline began around 670 BC because the empire gr grew too large and became uncontrollable. 656, the Egyptians declared independence. 30 years later, there was civil war, throne succession problems, political coups, kings and anti-kings. 626, the Chaldeans, they declared independence, and these Chaldeans, they are exactly those who rose to the Babylonian kingdom. And 612, Nabopolassar even conquered their capital city, Nineveh. And this is the way how Assyria very quickly went down. And this fall of Assyria was ultimately the rise of the next empire, which was the Neo-Babylonian Empire. As I already said to, you, um, uh, said to you, the Chaldeans, so the Babylonians, they had already conquered Nineveh and got uh, control over most of, the, most, of the, um, over most of Mesopotamia. What, what now remained was this rest Assyria in today's Syria and Turkish Anatolia. And as you can see, there were three competing world powers when we are in the year 609 BC. We have Egypt under King Necho II, which is also mentioned in the Bible. We have Babylon under King Neb Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar being his general, and Assyria. And all these three, they wanted to compete for world power. And everybody knows, knew, that there would be a decisive battle between those three. Assyria wanted to defeat the new Babylonian Empire and maintain its own kingdom. Egypt wanted to defeat the new Babylonian Empire and they also wanted to weaken Assyria's position to get stronger. And the new Babylonian Empire wanted to defeat Assyria and Egypt both to rise to the new dominating power in Middle East. And this all led to the Battle of Carchemish. Now, for the history, to, to know about the history of Judah, Necho II actually, as you can see, had to go from Egypt to Carchemish which was in Syria, today's Syria, and he had to pass through Judah. But Necho, the, uh, J Josiah, who was the king of Judah at that time, went against Necho, but he was killed in the battle of Megiddo. And this is the moment where Judah became Egypt's vessel. 
um, Judah, um, after Josiah died, chose Jehoahaz as a king, but he only um, reigned for about three months. Because Necho II, after defeating Josiah, he captured, um, he captured uh, Judah, captivated the king Jehoahaz, and installed Jehoiakim as a loyal pro-Egyptian king. So Judah became a pro-Egyptian country. Okay, so what were the results of this battle of Carchemish? The results were that Babylon is the new, first, that Babylon is the new dominating superpower in the Middle East region. Because uh, the Egyptians and the Assyrians, they tried to ally against Babylon. But Babylon defeated and crushed the armies of both Egypt and um, Assyria. So Babylon was the new superpower. And secondly, Assyria ceases to exist. It finally goes down. And thirdly, Judah falls in the hands of Babylon because the Egyptians, they were defeated and they, uh, and they have to give up Judah and Judah became a vessel of the Babylonian Empire. And this led to the three exile waves. The first exile wave um, happened around 605 BC when Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and captured it. Who was taken away in this first exile? There were young nobles from the royal family and of noble descent. So all the king's family and all the families of the high officials, they went all to Babylon. Babylon. And also at that time, Daniel, which was around 16 to 17 years old maybe, he also uh, was deported to Babylon. Now, four years later, the Babylonians, they tried to invade Egypt. But they had to, so they tried to invade Egypt, but they had to retreat because the Egyptian defenses were too strong. And therefore, um, because King Jehoiakim of Judah, he saw, oh, Babylon is weak because they can't invade Egypt. So, the Jehoiakim decides to rebel against Babel and stops praying, uh, paying tribute. And then, therefore, um, Babylon gets very angry and he moves against um, Jehoiakim, which led to the second exile, 598 BC. Jehoiakim dies in this year and his son Jehoiakim succeeds, but Nebuchadnezzar comes to take revenge um, against um, his uh, Jehoiakim falling away from him and sacks Jerusalem a, a second time. This leads to the second exile, where first Nebuchadnezzar installed Zedekiah as a king loyal to him, and who was now deported. So the king's family, there was, they, they were already deported. Also the most high nobles and officials, they were also deported. And now, all others who were qualified were deported. The best in the country, all the craftsmen and the workers and the qualified and educated workers, they were all deported. 7,000 of the highest officials, soldiers, skilled workers, and artisans were brought to Babylon. Also, Prophet Ezekiel was with the second exile wave um, brought to, uh, deported to Babylon. And what was the result? Judah became a very poor country because only the poorest people were left, which we can read in 2 Kings chapter 24. And 11 years later, Zedekiah doesn't want, does, does not listen to Jeremiah's, uh, Jeremiah's warning, prophet Jeremiah's warning. He also rebels against Nebuchadnezzar because he tries to set up an anti-Babylonian alliance. But this anti-Babylonian alliance fails and therefore, Nebuchadnezzar gets angry again against Judah, goes again against, um, uh, against this rebelling Judah again, and now he wants to lay complete final siege to Jerusalem, and he wants to completely destruct this city so that it can never rebel again. And this leads us to the third exile. The temple, the king's palace, and all houses were burned. The walls were torn down, all people who were left in the city of Jerusalem were deported except the workers on the vineyards and the fields. And this is the end of the physical 
of the kingdom of Judah. So why was Judah, had Judah to go down like this? Because the sin of, and evilness of Judah has reached its full measures. Except these five God-fearing kings, most of the kings, um, God's, uh, God had to say about them, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They did not listen to God's word. They worshipped numerous other gods and Baal, and they did not held the Sabbath. And how did Nebuchadnezzar deal with the defeated? This is, um, so we already learned about the Assyrian strategy, and now we learn about the, um, he, now we learn about the, uh, the Babylonian strategy. Now, one strategy was military conquest and destruction, as we can see in the three exile waves, waves 605, 598, 586. Each time, Nebuchadnezzar went, went against the city to conquer the city. Um, he, uh, one, of, uh, one of the strategies was also deportation and exile, especially not only these three exile waves, especially all the kingdoms, from all the kingdoms he defeated, all the high officials and the king's families was deported to um, Babylon mainland so that they would, be, they would all become de uh, countries dependent on Babylon. Also economic exploitation and tribute because Judah had to pay very high um, tributes as a vassal state and all high qualified people were deported. But the most dangerous strategy that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians executed was complete identity change and total assimilation. As we read in Daniel chapter 1, verse 7, the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, to Azariah, Abednego. And when we look at the meaning of those names, we can see um, this strategy. Daniel, for example, means God is judge, but his new name was completely against the other direction. Baal protect the king. Hananiah means God is great, but Shadrach means rule of the moon God. Mishael means who is like God, but Meshach means who is like the moon God. Azariah means God has helped, but Abednego means servant of Nurgal. So these new names were all to worship the Babylonian gods and Babylonian culture. But we can, this, also, this, everything here now seems kind of hopeless. But also in this time of exile, we see that God continues his story. And God is the sovereign ruler who prepares through the holy stump a spiritual reawakening. And I want to mention two people. The first one is Daniel and his friends. In this dark time, Daniel and his friends, they stayed absolutely faithful to their identity as the holy people of God. When we read Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. With this, Daniel testified to his clear spiritual identity as a kingdom of priests and as a people of God. He all, Daniel and his friends also testified to God the king, testified God even to the king, no matter what the cost. Now Nebuchadnezzar at that time was the world ruler. No one was more powerful than him. But Daniel in chapter 2, for example, testified to the sovereign God, the true king, and the ruler of history of all lives before the Babylonian king. Because the Babylonian king, as you remember in Daniel 2, he had this dream. And there, God proclaimed, uh, Daniel proclaimed God that he is the true ruler of history who will raise up his eternal kingdom and will, after all the worldly kingdoms, perish. Also his friends, when Nebuchadnezzar demanded them to worship this great statue he has built, they testified, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. 
But even if he, does, if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. With this, they testified, to, they, they, they testified their faithfulness to their one and only God, and they testified to the Almighty God who is able to um, save them from the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. Also, when Daniel was again in danger of his life under the king of Darius because of the lions and the law that nobody is, uh, should worship any other than the king, what he did was three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. So they stayed absolutely faithful to God, no matter what the cost. They wanted even to risk their lives for the sake of God. And even in this dark time where there seemed no hope, Daniel prays for his people to God with the hope and the promise of God. He took Israel's sins to be his sins, and he prayed, Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people pay your name. Daniel appeals to God in prayer, not because maybe the Israelites were righteous. The Israelites were full of sin and guilt. But Daniel came with this sin in repentance to God and he appealed to God with God's promise for his people and he sought to see what God's good counsel for his people was. And when Daniel lived this shepherd life for his people and faithfully lived with this promise of God, he could see God's great vision and hope for the spiritual restoration of his people. He could see that God holds world history in his hand. In the time of persecution through the Antichrist, God speaks. For what has been determined must take place. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel could see how God will judge his enemies. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Daniel chapter 11, 45. And he could also see how God delivers and saves his people and completely restores them. Daniel chapter 12, 1 says, Your people, uh, at that time Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Wasn't that a great promise for the people in exile and for Daniel? Because this showed that the time of exile, this is not a time of tribulation. It is the time of God's love, where God pre, pre, where God, and it is the time of God's love and of God's preparation so that God's people can be fully restored as the people of God. In this way, God helped Daniel to have assurance and victorious hope that the salvation and the spiritual restoration of God's people has and will take place. And what was God's counsel for Daniel until the end? We can read this in chapter 12, verse 3 from the book of Daniel. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. With this promise, Daniel lived his whole life as a witness of God, as an influential Bible teacher who planted the hope of God in the hearts of the exiled Israelites so that the counsel of God could be prepared for the future time. And another, the second one I want to mention is Ezekiel. He was also in exile. And he was with Daniel, one of the most important prophets for the diaspora of God's people. And when we read the book of Ezekiel, we will learn about that from the IBS lecture of Shepherd Warmhertz. We read about first 
God's judgment over Judah, which is just because of its sinful deeds, chapter 1 to 24. But we also see that God is almighty, that God is present, and that God is the ruler of all nations, chapter 25 to 32. And based on that, we also see how Ezekiel saw what the counsel of God to completely restore Israel. This is the rest of the book. As chapter 20, uh, 36 from the book of Ezekiel says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And chapter 37, verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. So what was God's vision for his people? It was that they were soldiers and fighters for God. And shortly after that, in verse 26 of the same chapter, he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. What a wonderful promise, which already points to the everlasting covenant that will be raised up with Jesus Christ. So what was God's counsel for Ezekiel in this time of exile? We can read this in verse 4. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. With God's hope and vision and faith, Ezekiel was to testify God's great vision to live as a Bible teacher. So Ezekiel was to live as a Bible teacher, planting this great restoration vision in the hearts of the exiled people. He was to encourage and mobilize and prepare the, the revival work of God by preaching this living word of God to those who are still dead, the exiled Israelites. Now, what was the, how did it go with the Babylonian Empire? The Babylonian Empire, very shortly after that, decree, uh, de declined. 562, there were three kings following Nebuchadnezzar, but they were all assassinated. So Nebuchadnezzar was the only uh, king that was able to build up such a kingdom, but all kings following him, they were just not able to manage this kingdom. There was a king Nabonid from 56 to 52 who brought about new stability, but only temporary. And because he went away somewhere else, he was assisted by Bel Belshazzar, who was obviously unable to manage this king. He, um, yeah, he had to, he, Belshazzar had to assist Nabonid because Nabonid at that time, he was already very old. In the 60s and 70s, he was. There was the growing Persian threat, as you can see in the map, the Persians were about to invade Babylon, and there was growing inner turmoil that cannot be handled alone, because in Babylon, this was not one people. There were many different people and nations in this state, so um, the uh, Babylonian Empire was about to be torn apart, and eventually, at 539, Belshazzar, as the last king, was deposed, and was conquered by the Persian Empire. So, it was ultimately a very short-lived empire that was destructed by Carus II of Medo-Persia. It was a kingdom that only lasted for about 80 to, at maximum, 100 years. But at the same time, we see, while this Assyrian kingdom went down, while the Babylonian empire went down, we see Oh, God continues his story. 539, there's the Edict of Curus. This is where the Edict was written on, which allowed the Israelites and the Jews to go back from exile to Judah. And well, as we will see in tomorrow's lesson, God's people return to rebuild the Holy Land, and we will experience full spiritual restoration and reawakening. So what was the legacy of holy remnants 
and Bible teachers like Ezekiel and Daniel? What can we learn from them today? We learn that the 70 years exile was not a time of resignation, or it was not a time of hopelessness, or it was not lost 70 years. We see that exactly this time was a time of God's hope, where God used the holy stumps who lived as faithful Bible teachers, who stayed faithful to his promise, and who testified to God as the true ruler over the world to encourage his people in exile. It was a time of hope where God revealed his great counsel to fully restore his people spiritually. And it was the time where God revealed the final defeat of the enemies and the rule and the kingship through David's servant, lastly, the everlasting covenant raised up by Jesus Christ. And this was the great hope that was established exactly in these 70 years, which brought about a spiritual reawakening through Nehemiah, Ezra, and, um, Ezra, and continued God's history until the birth of Jesus Christ. But this is a lesson for tomorrow and in today's.